Okay, I think we're all done with that stuff now. So good evening, and who's here? Jared and Jerry. I'm doing my. It used to be Miss Nancy in my area with romp room. Although those of you who are old enough to remember romp room may also know that um, these things were all regional. So uh, we had Miss Nancy. I don't know who other people had in other areas. Miss this, miss that. Jay Scott, hello, Kelly, hello, Alexis, it's happening. Uh, who else have we got here? Jeremy, hi, Jeremy, hi, Bob, hi, Nancy, hi, not Miss Nancy from Romp Room, another Nancy, hi, Nancy, hi, Becca, hi, Barb, and, and Angie, and Alexis again. Alexis, put that bone down. Okay, uh, anyway, I, I realized that I was, for those of you who were also listening to last night's um, reading, where I was finishing Caliban's Hour for the Overseas Crowd, um, I was saying, and I don't know what I'll be reading tomorrow. But then, of course, you know, in the light of day, with my brain somewhat working, hi, Mike, hi, Jim, um, with my brain somewhat working, I realized, oh, wait, I've got the other half of that story I was reading. So that's what I will be reading tonight. We have the second half of the Pogo Cashman story uh, called Three Lilies, Three Leopards, and a Participation Ribbon in Science is the name of the story. So I'm going to be reading that first. An update, nothing really to update. We had 4th of July yesterday. Um, I set the barbecue on fire. Uh, never the, well, it wasn't really me. It was uh, my co-conspirator, Meat. I uh, just set the barbecue on fire, but we won't, we're not going to point fingers here, especially not at chunks of ground up flesh that can't point back, just for any of you out there who um, are uh, meat defenders, I apologize. Uh, yes, I'm still a carnivore, especially on the 4th of July, but I have been paid back for my sins by the complete refusal of meat to behave properly and instead to fall into the fire start a massive grease fire, uh, nearly set the forest ablaze for miles in all directions, uh, all kinds of exciting things. But it all worked out in the end. We salvaged enough food to have a very nice dinner. We watched Hamilton, um, which was good fun. And uh, I had been fortunate enough to see it last year live with, uh, with daughter. And so everybody else who hadn't got to see it at that point got to see it on television. And uh, there's, of course, all kinds of uh, revisionist reconsiderations of Hamilton going on. And, you know, I mean, to the extent that it's a political thing, it's legitimate to look at it, look what's changed since it came out, et cetera, et cetera. The fact is, it's a brilliant piece of theater. It just simply is. It's, it's extremely well written. Um, we got to watch it with the subtitles on because Deb and I, with our old people ears, are not allowed to have the volume up as loud as we would like uh, because the kids go, oh my God, it's so loud. Um, so <laughs> we put the subtitles on. And actually, that was lots of fun because there's, um, with the live performance, there's a lot of stuff you miss just because it's happening so fast. The rap is, you know, the wrapping is so quick in some cases, and there's also other things going on and all that. So I actually got to pick up more of the words. And Medardo is with us tonight. Hello, Medardo. Good to see you. And uh, bienvenidos. Bienvenidos a mi página. ¿sí? Okay. Mi página de Facebook. And um, so uh, anyway, so we got to watch that, and it made for a nice family kind of hang on the 4th of July, because of course we, unlike some people, were not out spreading germs or potentially spreading germs. We were home spreading germs among those whom 
we had already shared lots of germs with. So I hope you all had a similarly kind of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a, a safe and sensible holiday, those of you who celebrate uh, Fourth of July, because obviously that's kind of an American holiday, so I don't expect, well, actually, <laughs> these days maybe the Brits are going, hooray, Fourth of July, thank God those people left. Um, not that things are that much better there, but whatever the case, we had a good 4th of July. I hope you did too. And um, the, the, the fires were under control eventually and everything else was okay. So, uh, and not too many fireworks. So poor big dog Johnny, who is mortally terrified of fireworks, did not have to spend the night um, under the bed or anything. Um, in fact, we were really glad we could stay home with Johnny this time. We had a very good excuse. Normally we do a family thing with my parents and my brothers and their wives and the kids and we all get together. Um, and uh, when we came back last year, um, thinking because we we're up in the hills that there wasn't anything too much to worry about noise wise. And instead we came back and found literally that our poor dog, John, who, you know, does not like loud noises, surprises, things falling. Uh, John had chewed a big chunk out of the door frame poor guy. So we're going to have to, if we go back to doing 4th of July out of the house again, we're going to just have to start taking him with us or something. Anyway, so that's, uh, you know, this is the one of those things that, that pet owners and um, parents know about. You don't always have complete freedom to do the things that you want to do, speaking of freedom. So anyway, now I am back here. It is now seven minutes after seven and I have gone bibble babble, bibble babble, and I haven't started my story yet. So I should get on with that because we're going to finish it tonight, but I don't know quite how long. We got a, almost exactly halfway through. Uh, again, the story is uh, one that I wrote for a Paul Anderson anthology. I keep forgetting to look the anthology up, but uh, it was a good anthology with a lot of very good writers in it. Paul Anderson, P-O-U-L, Paul Anderson, um, Scandinavian name. Paul Anderson was a really fine writer, as well as being the father of the redoubtable Astrid Bear and father-in-law of the equally redoubtable Greg Bear. Paul Anderson was a wonderful writer of both science fiction and fantasy. He wrote one of my very favorite science fiction books, Tau Zero, which is uh, a hard science fiction about the effects of uh, faster than light or near, near light travel. Um, but he also wrote a bunch of really excellent uh, fantasy novels of various kinds, including the one that this is a bit of a joke on, um, which is called Three Hearts and Three Lions, which is about a, um, an engineer, a science, a science and engineering guy, not, a, not unlike Paul Anderson himself, who is a very knowledgeable guy in the sciences, um, who gets swept into the world of the we would say Carolinian myth cycle. Carolinian refers, of course, to Charlemagne, Charles the Great. And that myth cycle is called the Matter of France. And uh, it is equivalent in its way to um, the Matter of Britain, which is King Arthur, Lancelot, Guinevere, all them folk. And uh, in the story, this, this modern day accidental adventurer is thrown into all these situations with giants and dragons and all these things. And he uses his present day 20th century white guy powers <laughs> to uh, solve problems. And so my version is not quite that satisfying for those who like their heroes competent. Um, my version is also utilizes another character that I've used before, um, who is Pogo Cashman, who is kind of another version of myself back in the 1970s. Um, although this would have been in the slightly later 1970s than the Elric story. And Pogo at this point is working as the manager of a shoe store. And when he falls into this adventure, this also introduces Quid Probe and various other folk from um, the sort of universal or multiversal department of fiction. And they have discovered that the wrong person, because they were supposed to send some British guy, just very similar to the original story, the original Paul Anderson story, where a guy who has an engineering background and is very competent is sent to this place. 
in this version, um, it's really, it's my story. So instead of a very super confident guy who's like a British ex-soldier and all that, that, that Pogo got sent instead. And of course he's completely incompetent and doesn't get any of what's going on. So that's what's going on in this. No, no useful SAS trained veteran guy, but instead the 19 year old manager of a shoe store in Southern California. And as he's gone along, he's messed up everything, of course. So he, he, act, he used the cell, uh, the spell book that he had that would have saved him in some situations. And he used it for kindling and he had a magical horn, but he made the mistake of using it as a drinking cup and jammed up the end of it and it, with wax. And it, because it was mead, it wound up full of bees and all that. Meanwhile, Quid Probe, who's one of these guys from the multiversal department of fiction, is traveling with him in the guise of his, his trusty dwarf sidekick from the original stories of this character, Astolfo, um, who is the fictional person that, that uh, Pogo is inhabiting. And they've come into contact with several people, including the giant Caligurant, um, and managed to defeat him, mostly through luck. And then um, also the, the robber Orillo, who is immortal, and who, you know, if you cut off his arms, like the Black Knight in Monty Python, uh, if you cut off his arms, he just sticks them back on. You cut off his head, the head's still alive, and it eventually, his body sticks it back on. But anyway, so what happened is during the course of this, the very hungry giant that Pogo and Quid Probe had, had defeated and who has been complaining about it um, ate Orillo's body. So they are now going on with their quest with Orillo's head in a sack and they're riding on the giant. And so that's what's going on. So those are our four primary players at this point. The giant, Caligurant, Orillo the bandit, Pogo passing for Astolfo, and Quid Probe the multiversal, multidimensional other being who's trying to save the day here because of a mistake that they made. So anyway, that's where we are and they are now riding the giant. So now I will begin after wasting a huge amount of time. So three lilies, three leopards, and a participation ribbon in science is the story. Me! Hungry again, said the giant, as he waded through the waves toward the Ethiopian shore. Swimming hard work. Food was stringy, too. I'll thank you to speak a little more courteously about me, Orillo's head complained from inside the sack. Or about my body, anyway. I mean, I am right here. How do you think I feel? And I am not stringy. I am sinewy. You say sinewy, me say stringy, point is not enough good stuff. Will you both shut up, Pogo asked. The two of them, giant and disembodied head, had spent the entire swim arguing about what kind of whale fish that was and whether the wind was nor'east or nor'south or nor something. It was... Oh, it was like listening to Big Ed's and Little Ed's endlessly stupid disputes back at the store about whether Han Solo could beat Dirty Harry in a fist fight. Hey, if you can't keep quiet in that bag, I'll put you down the back of the giant's pants instead. Think you like that better? Charmless, said Orillo, but fell silent. So what now? Pogo asked the dwarf. Bradbury only knows, Quid Probe said glumly. This is a fictional universe originally created by Paul Anderson based on a world created by a bunch of medieval poets. But this is some other writer doing a cheap knockoff of Anderson's world with characters taken from Ariostro's version. And you, he blanched. I just had a horrid thought. What if this hack chose you as the protagonist on purpose? We could be in the hands of a madman. Yeah. Pogo agreed, although he hadn't understood anything the dwarf had just said. Harry Ostro and Paul Anderson sounded like the names of Muppets. So, like I said, what now? If this story were being written by a real writer like Anderson, I might have some idea, the dwarf said, scowling. But with this fool in charge, well, anything could happen. 
And since they couldn't even send me a proper Anderson hero with a working knowledge of science and engineering and such, well, whatever does happen is bound to be pretty stupid. What did you say you did for a living anyway? Retail management, said Pogo promptly. That always sounded better than mentioning the shoe store. Well, that should do us a world of good. The little man didn't really sound like he meant it. As the day wore on, the hilly slope continued to lead them upward through dry, mostly barren country until Pogo could see they were climbing the highest of a small range of rocky hills. As they neared the top of the hill, Pogo noticed what he at first thought were large birds wheeling in the air above the hilltop, although something about their shapes didn't look quite right. We're getting near, said Quid Pro. What's well, good, right? Good in the sense that we're at the next stage of the quest, said Quid Pro. Bad in that we're going to have to deal with the harpies somehow. And to be honest, I can't imagine what we're going to do in a million years. Harpies? Horrible female demons. They persecute Prester John. He's blind. They steal his food. Whoa! I saw this movie, Pogo said. There were skeletons in it, too. And Hercules. I think it was called Jason and the Astronauts. The dwarf made a noise of irritation. This is not a movie. This can kill you. But to be fair, Ariosto did steal that bit from the original Jason and the Argonauts, so in that sense, you're right. A hopeful look momentarily lit the dwarf's brown, wrinkled face. How did they deal with the harpies in this moving picture? I don't know. I was kind of stoned, to be honest. I think they threw a net on them and whacked the shit out of them with swords or something. Too bad we didn't save the giant's net, huh? Quid probe sighed. Yes. And I'm guessing a proper Paul Anderson hero would have remembered that before we swam across the ocean. We? inquired the giant. Me think not. Yeah, it's a bummer. Pogo was getting a bit tired of the adventure now. It had gone on way too long to be just an acid flashback, at least as far as he knew, although to be fair, pretty much all he knew about flashbacks were health class warnings and what he'd seen on Hawaii Five-O and streets of San Francisco. Also, the thing Quid Probe had said about this can kill you hadn't exactly made him feel warm and tingly. Speaking of not feeling warm and tingly, the closer to the hilltop they got, the easier it was for Pogo to see that the flying shapes weren't anything like birds. They were human-sized and their wings looked more like the kind you saw on bats. Stuff that was Cool on movies and television seemed a lot less fun when it was flying back and forth not far away, letting out nasty, screechy noises that echoed down the dusty hillside. May I just mention that it's getting really unpleasant inside this sack, announced Arillo's head. If I had known I was going to spend hours smelling my own breath, I would have taken up that newfangled teeth-cleaning fad. Why you complain, said Caligrant. You ride in nice bag. Me have to carry you all. Uphill, too. Uh, you tried to eat us, Pogo reminded him. He did eat me, said the head in the bag. Me didn't ride you, the giant said, sulky as a sixth grader whose parents would only buy him cheap knockoff running shoes instead of pumas. Me play fair. I don't recall you being particularly fair to me when you ate my body, Orillo said. One moment it was just standing there, the next moment, hey, presto, it's lunchtime. Mm, me couldn't help it. Was right there, begging me eat it. It wasn't doing anything of the sort, said the muffled voice from the sack, because it didn't have a head on. So spare us the untruthful excuses. Me meant metaphorically. Well, then I wish you have only had eaten my body metaphorically too, you large oaf. Then I wouldn't be bouncing along here all day having to smell the onion I broke my fast on two days ago. And it wasn't even a particularly nice onion. If I had known I was going to spend the rest of my life in a sack, I would doubtless have been a bit more selective. 
Pogo smacked the bag so hard that Arilo's teeth clicked together. Jeez, just shut up. You should be quiet too, Pogo Cashman, the dwarf said in hushed tones. We're almost there, and harpies have sharp ears. As they neared the top of the hill, Pogo could see the ruins of what had once been a castle. The harpies were swooping in and out past the broken walls, busy as mosquitoes during swim trials at fat camp. Someone seemed to be shouting at them. Curse you, foul creatures! Why do you torment me? But though the words were angry, the tone seemed strangely weary, even resigned, like a woman with a size nine foot, trying yet again to fit into a size seven pump. It's coming from over there, quit poke, Pogo told the dwarf. I don't ask much said the little bearded man, just as resigned and despairing as the mystery voice. Just that you use my correct name. Once, anyway, once would be nice. The climb was not an easy one, even on giant back. Oh, grand, called Orilo's head from inside the sack. Bump, bump, bump. Are you sure you can't jounce me around a little more? Maybe you could drop me and kick me like a football. Don't you ever stop talking? asked Pogo. I might, if I had something else to do. In fact, I've been told I am actually a very good listener. But for some reason, I don't seem able to, oh, I don't know, play a game or dance or whittle or do pretty much anything else to entertain myself. <gasps> now, why is that? Oh, right, because you let your pet ogre eat my body. Pet ogre, rumbled Caligarat. Me not pet, me prisoner of war. They rounded a bend in the hilltop path, and now Pogo could make out a spot in the ruins where an entire section of wall had fallen away, revealing the shell of some mighty hall. It was around this crumbling structure that the harpies whirled. A pale figure cringed in a tiny alcove, partially sheltered from their attack, but not from the, the abuse the flying creatures hurled at him. And not just abuse. The harpies also sprayed their own filth everywhere as they flew. The rocks all around were streaked with the stuff, and the buzzing of flies seemed almost as loud as the shrieks of the old man and his tormentors. They might look very much like angry old ladies, but Pogo now knew for a fact that harpies did not wear adult diapers. Man, that guy is screwed, he said. That's Prester John, Quid Pro looked worried. You have to save him. Why? I didn't put him there. It's just how it works. Quests, heroes, don't you ever read? Sometimes, magazines and shit. Me want rest, said Caligarant. Me tired and hungry. An idea came to Pogo. Could you um, eat those harpies? The giant made a face. Me not eat. Taste like poo poo. Me dry like twigs. Well, said Aurelio's head from inside the sack. I suppose I should be relieved that my poor body was consumed by such an Epicure. I mean, I wouldn't want to be eaten by someone who devoured just anything. Caligarant swiveled his head like a tank turret to look back at Pogo. Me eat talking head now? Stop head talking? We must save Prester John, said the dwarf. Pogo frowned, trying to imagine a scenario in which he might go running through a downburst of little old lady, or little old bat wing lady crap and not being able to manage it. But even as he stared, the harpies suddenly rose up into the air in a single coherent swarm, wheeled once more above the ruins, and then flew off, shrieking and cackling. Now! The dwarf smacked him on the arm. Go now! Pogo sighed and gave the giant a thump of his heels, setting him lumbering across the open area toward the ruined walls and the weeping, white-bearded figure that the dwarf had named Presto John. Dude, I totally don't get this, Pogo said as he helped the quivering, sightless man into the shelter of one of the crumbling chambers. Why are those crazy bat ladies out to get you? Presto John had been tall, 
you could tell he'd been a big guy once, like a football player or something. But his troubles had bent him until he looked almost like a question mark. His beard was long and fouled by stuff Pogo didn't want to think about too much. Just being next to him would have been an issue, except the whole place already stank of harpy shit. I was vainglorious, the old man said. I imagined myself as king of not only fair Ethiop, but of the earthly paradise as well, where once Adam and his consort Eve did dwell. What's this old blind guy supposed to do for us? Pogo whispered to the dwarf. Is he a magician or something? He figured with a name like Presto, the guy must do some tricks. I, I, I don't mean to be a dick or anything, but he can't even wash his beard. If you save him, he'll do a favor for Roland's allies, the dwarf whispered back. That's all you really need to know. I can hear you, bold paladin. My ears have not failed, only my orbs of vision, John said sadly. And yes, I would gladly give you all that was in my power to give were I free. But here I remain until someone can rescue me from these ghastly creatures who delight only in my punishment. He shook his head. Not only do they steal and foul my food so that I am always near starvation, they talk to me incessantly, as if a pious Christian man like me would ever bandy words with such demons of darkness. Talk to you? About what? Did you hear me not, Sir Knight? I said I do not bandy words with Satan's underlings. They would doubtless wish me to listen to their complaints. Oh, a rare irony, for they claim they are bored by the very task of tormenting me. Would that I had my sight and my sword, then would I give them a challenge. They would never forget. For a moment, the ancient man tried to draw himself up to his once impressive height, but it was too painful, and he curled in on himself again in despair. But perhaps you, good Sir Knight, for I hear by your voice that you are a bold and doughty man. Perhaps you could punish them and quiet their endless taunting and shrieking. Pogo did not answer, and not just because there was no way in hell he was going to get in a fight with a bunch of magical flying crap flingers. He was thinking, and though it was not something he did very much, he was busy at it now. The bony faces of the harpies had reminded him of a certain kind of senior citizen customer that always drove him crazy. The kind that just couldn't be satisfied, that always had one more question, one more stupid little complaint. But more important, now he was also remembering Dooley, the roving assistant manager from the Pasadena branch of Kirby Shoes, who had been sent in by the main office to help when Fernando and little Ed had both been out sick for a few days. Dooley had been a genius at dealing with old biddies, listening to them as if their confused questions and complaints actually made sense, letting them take all day to make a decision on a lousy pair of seven ninety nine slippers. Instead of trying to hurry them into buying or leaving, which is what Pogo and his co-workers had always done, Dooley would just gather several of the oldest customers together in one part of the store where he could chat with and flatter them all at the same time, saving time and steps. Turned out most of them were lonely and just wanted something to do, which is why they were in the mall in the first place. But if a young man in a suit and tie listened to them attentively, they'd actually buy things. Dooley booked a surprising amount of sales just from such crabby, unlikely customers, and Pogo had never forgotten it. His thoughts were interrupted by a squeak from the dwarf. They're coming back! I can hear them! They never give me rest. Presto John said sadly. Truly I am cursed for my damnable pride. Pogo reached into the saddlebag and pulled Arillo's head out by the hair. It blinked in the sunlight. Zons! You could give a fellow some warning, the head complained. Here's what's going to happen, Pogo told him. I'm going to toss you up there where the harpies are. I don't know whether they'll, they'll eat you or crap on you or just drop you 20 or 30 times from really high up. Maybe they'll do all of that, he considered for a moment. 
Although not necessarily in that order. What? The bandit's handsome face contorted in dismay. You would murder me in cold blood? Hogu did feel a little bad about it, but Orillo had been planning to carve him up too, just like he did everyone else who passed by. Look, let's face it, Pogo told the head. I'm not going to carry you around with me for the rest of my life, but I'll bet those harpies would love someone to talk to. So if you just make some chit-chat with them, act real sweet and listen real good, they probably won't kill you. Hell, they might even be nice to you. He remembered some of the senior customers and suppressed a shudder. You know, like uh, give you hard candy with bits of Kleenex stuck to it. Show you pictures of their fat grandkids, stuff like that. They're right above us, the dwarf shouted. We have to get to some shelter. But Pogo had other plans. He waited until the first few harpies had swished past over their heads, shrieking and cursing and spattering the nearby stones with things too disgusting to think about, let alone describe. Then he took Orillo's head and spun it around by the hair like an Olympic hammer which made the head yell some interesting French swear words, then threw it straight up into the air. One of the harpies turned in mid-flight and snatched it with her claws like an eagle taking whatever eagles took, some other kind of bird, except instead of a bird, this was a head that was still screaming as she carried it high up or higher up into the air. Don't hurt me, Aurelo's head shouted as it disappeared. Some of my best friends are harpish. Even as the giant left the ruins and clumped down the hillside, Quid Probe couldn't quite figure out what had just happened. But why did the harpies just leave? They just wanted someone to talk to, said the Pogo Cash Man with an air of satisfaction. Like those old guys you meet waiting for a bus. They probably won't even remember old Presto here, he indicated the blind man clutching the giant's shoulder nervously, until they had told the head the same stories about their operations and stuff about 90 times. You have saved me, brave Astolfo, quavered the old man. Bring me down the mountain and I will take my armies to war against wicked Agramant. John let out a dry chuckle. He was definitely perking up. That foul Saracen dog will not enjoy besieging Paris when he learns I am burning his castles here at home. Quid Probe could only shake his head. The Pogo Cash Man was proving to be more resourceful than he'd expected, but the odds were still running very high that the organic creature's dumb luck could not last, and that in the end they would be just as completely and hideously doomed as Quid Probe had always feared. Still, it was a pleasant surprise to be out in the sunshine and away from the harpies, even if he was still forced to ride a stinking giant beside an old man who is not particularly clean either. So what's next, little dude? The pogo cash man asked. We'll drop Mr. John at the nearest town, then fly to the moon, right? With some guy named Griff the hippo? Quid probe shook his head. I doubt the hippogriff will be available to us, since we no longer have a horse to trade for it. The fair Bradamant will not wish to ride into battle on a steed as stenchful and unpleasant as this ogre. Me can hear you, rumbled Caligarant from immediately beneath Quid Probe's dwarfish bottom. Me find that hurtful. It took them several days to find their way across the wilds of Ethiopia or at least this imaginary version of Ethiopia, to the mountain atop which Quid Pro believed they would find the earthly paradise. He could only hope he was right, since this particular location had never been written into Anderson's original work and only faintly implied by its connection to the rest of the matter of France. But hoping and guessing was all the sub-sub-manager had been doing since he'd been thrust into this ruptured story anyway. The Pogo Cash Man, Buoyed by his victories, spent much of the journey explaining to Quid Probe how he had been inspired by tracts like the Sales Pyramid or Think Accessories to Add Value. Somehow, the whole of his philosophy seemed to come down to telling people, I have a handbag for you that would go great with those. 
an eldritch phrase of indubitable power, at least according to the Pogo cash man. Quid probe could only shrug. That was one thing that having shoulders was good for anyway, and hoped their luck would continue to hold, although he thought it unlikely. For one thing, the saints that inhabited the earthly paradise were likely to be a fearfully rules-oriented bunch, and he suspected they weren't going to like the Pogo cash man's rather freewheeling approach to the matter of France. His retail philosophies finally exhausted, the Pogo cash man was now engaged in his newest pastime, spitting for distance and accuracy from the summit of the giant shoulders. Each, each expectoration accompanied by the odd ritualistic chant, got you again, Vader. It was hard to believe the Pogo, Pogo cash man was a genuine bull organic, his sperm coveted by all the females of his species, but there had to be evolutionary subtleties that quid probe could not grasp. He was beginning to think that for all his years studying them in preparation for his job, he would never really understand non-symbolic life forms. Another trudge up another long hill, the giant moaning and grumbling all the way. Caligarant want to lie down. Caligarant foot hurt. Me hungry again. It was worse than working a lonely Sunday shift with little Ed, who had the conversational skills of a snappish dog. So what's up this mountain anyway, Pogo asked Quid Probe. I told you, the dwarf said, it's the earthly paradise. It used to be the Garden of Eden. So, Pogo said hopefully, like a restaurant or something? The little man sighed. He did that a lot. Pogo was beginning to suspect the dwarf had asthma like Little Ed, or at least like Little Ed claimed he had. Pogo thought it was funny how Little Ed only had asthma attacks when it was time to clean the lavatory. Not anything like a restaurant, the dwarf explained. It's where the saints live. Is knowing that not part of your human religious rituals? Don't know. The closest Pogo had ever come to church as a kid was when his electrician father had installed a 40 watt light bulb in a manger for the local church's nativity play. The bulb had been baby Jesus. When the play was over, Pogo's dad had brought it home. Here, he had told Pogo, go bury this in the backyard and see if it comes back to life in three days. His dad had moved out a few weeks later and Pogo had never asked him exactly what he had meant. As they climbed, Pogo couldn't help noticing that the foliage was growing more lush, the sights more lovely, and even the smells more pleasant. Grass as green as astroturf grew everywhere, and bright flowers pushed their way up between the stems, colorful as an Easter sails display. The bees were big as sparrows, but mellow as old hippies, and the sun shone warmly everywhere, but the cool inviting shade beneath the majestic trees growing beside the track. Wow. Pogo said, paying his highest compliment to natural beauty. Somebody ought to build vacation condos here and start a timeshare business. They would totally clean up. When they reached the summit of the hill, they discovered a grassy plain of a grandeur that matched the approach, and at the center of it, a vast palace that looked to be carved from a single ruby. Behold, the dwarf said, the earthly paradise. Whoa said Pogo. That's bitchin'. Me hungry again, said the giant. As they grew closer, the palace became no less amazing, sunlight glinting from every angle and facet, so that the castle sat in a sparkling red glow. As they reached the tall gate, it slowly rose to reveal a white-bearded man who looked to Pogo like nothing so much as a skinny Santa Claus. The man greeted them warmly, although he did seem a bit taken aback by Caligarant. Come, he said, enter and make yourselves welcome, travelers. Refresh yourselves. Your steed will be seen to as well. What would you eat and drink? The Lord's bounty is such we can give you whatever your heart desires. Little fat women, said the giant promptly. What young? Me like them crunchy, not chewy. The bearded man suppressed a shudder. Perhaps we can find a suckling pig or two for your mount, he told Pogo. 
So few of our guests eat pork anyway. It's a desert tribe thing. You are the holy evangelist, aren't you? Asked Quid Probe, who was trying to brush his tangled whiskers into a more respectable shape. John the Baptist, as some call you? Pogo had thought John the Baptist was some kind of Southern University, but the man nodded. It's true, I am he that trumpeted the coming of our savior. And now that you have come to us, pious Astolfo, he said, this time talking to Pogo, the saints and I will try to help you accomplish your quest. For your liege, Charlemagne, is dear to us, and his kingdom, the bulwark of Christendom against both the Saracen and the treacherous fairies. Pogo had walked past a club in Hollywood once, and a very, very tall woman had tried to get him to come inside. He'd almost gone in, too, until he'd got close enough to see the woman's five o'clock shadow. Pogo Cashman might not know what Saracens were, but he felt sure he knew all about treacherous fairies. The saints came out to meet them, not marching in, as Pogo had hoped, but walking like normal people. Still, they seemed nice, if a trifle on the quiet side, and the food they laid out on the long table in their splendid dining room, although a plain meal of butter, bread, honey, and some kind of vegetable soup that didn't even have alphabet noodles in it, was as tasty as anything Pogo had encountered for a long time. Thus, when they showed him and Quid Probe to a clean, warm room with two beds, Pogo was ready to drop immediately. But the dwarf seemed determined to talk. They'll want to make sure you're a shriven and holy knight before they help you get to the moon, the dwarf said, clearly worried. Saints are supposed to be big on things like that. Pogo yawned. He wondered if Buzz Aldrin's golf club was still lying around up there. Maybe he'd get to hit a couple of drives. Once he'd realized that the astronauts were going to be attacked by moon men, the golf part had been the one thing about the whole Apollo mission that had caught Pogo's imagination. But when he asked the dwarf about it, Quid Probe only seemed irritated. By Dunsany's jodpers, are you even paying attention, Pogo Cashman? This isn't your world, and that isn't your moon. In fact, it's not even a real moon. It's a medieval moon filtered through at least two or three different storytellers. It's probably made of some kind of cheese. No, uh, I don't mean that. And don't you dare ask me the question I can see forming even now. Pogo grunted his disappointment. So? This religious thing truly worries me. Anderson's story structure allows you some leeway to make mistakes, but they were expecting someone with an elementary knowledge of things like history and science that you don't seem to have. Well, I'm doing all right so far. The dwarf waved his hand. Yes, yes, but you're going to have to talk to the saints about your love of Christ and your holy vows as a knight before they help you. How are you going to get through that with... What did you call it? Guidelines for retail management? Well, then tell me what to say. You don't understand. The dwarf was sitting on his own bed, his feet dangling well above the stone floor. I studied story construction. My background is in themes and influences, in the sometimes very thin line between homage and plagiarism. Religious instruction is not my field. Okay, yeah, that's kind of dread. But Pogo was too tired and too full of good food to worry about it. He only wanted to sleep. Don't sweat it, little dude. I'll figure out something to tell him tomorrow. You don't figure out how to talk to the saints about religion, said Quid Probe in the helpless tone of a veterinarian trying to get a particularly stupid pit bull to let go of his arm. These are the founding fathers and mothers of the Christian religion. It's all they think about. But Pogo Cashman had shut his eyes. Somehow, though, despite the great and comfortable weariness that it, it was his greatest wish to surrender to, Pogo couldn't fall asleep. The idea that he would have to pay for this hospitality by answering questions about something he knew next to nothing about was beginning to trouble him, too. He doubted they would consider the story of his dad's light bulb enough to get him off the hook. Also, now that he was having his first comfortable night in a while, Pogo was perversely beginning to miss his tiny apartment, 
and especially his television and stereo, and wondering if he would ever get back. The experience hadn't been too bad for an acid flashback, which he had been assured back in high school consisted mostly of imagining you could fly and then jumping out of tall buildings, but it was definitely short on the modern conveniences. How long had he been here anyway? How many episodes of WKRP in Cincinnati had he missed? John the Baptist was all well and good, but Poco, Pogo needed a weekly dose of Johnny Fever. Quidbrobe said he wanted help from these religious guys to finish his quest. So he obviously wouldn't be getting to see Lonnie Anderson in her tight sweater unless he convinced them. He hated dealing with people who wanted him to learn a bunch of shit that only they cared about. In fact, it reminded him more than a little of one of his supervisor's Sunday schools, a nightmarish event that happened every couple of months where he kept all the employees in the store for hours after closing time, making them take tests about stock numbers and the courtesy checklist, and to learn slogans like, remember the GSM fat, greet seat measure, fit accessorized ticket. As manager, Pogo usually had to do the lion's share of work at these meetings, and sometimes even lead them while the supervisor watched him, like mall security following a shoplifter. The only way he'd found to escape the worst of these Sunday school sessions was to throw another employee under the bus, usually by saying something like, gee, sir, I'm having trouble getting Fernando to understand the value of bringing a packet of socks with every shoe he fits. Maybe it's the language barrier. This despite the fact that Fernando had been raised in Northridge and spoke English at least as well as Pogo, better if you counted all that grammar stuff. I'm like out of my depth, sir, he would tell the supervisor while Fernando pleaded with his eyes to be spared. Perhaps you could show us the best way to get through to him, which was usually enough to light an evangelical fire in the supervisor's eye and then Pogo could kick back and watch poor little Fernando get put through two hours of hell in his place, learning how to foist off expensive tube socks on various customers who were acted out by the supervisor. Which wasn't that bad an idea for his present problem, now that Pogo thought about it. Of course, Fernando, the perfect victim, wasn't here, and Pogo was nervous about how he would get back home without quid probe, but that didn't mean a suitable subject couldn't be found. Oh, yeah, he told John the Baptist when he had been ushered in to see the venerable evangelist. I'd totally love, I, I, I would totally love to talk about my holy vows and how hard I've been shrivening and everything. But first I need your help with a little religious matter, kind of a, a spreading the faith problem, if you get what I mean. The old man's eyes glinted like those of an avid shopper spotting a two-for-one table. Spreading the faith? Why, yes, I suppose I'd be the one to ask. John the Baptist tried to chuckle affably, but it had a slightly hungry sound. Uh, not meaning to toot my own horn, of course, but that's pretty much what I'm known for. Of course, all these centuries living here, waiting for the last judgment and surrounded by those who are already saints, I, I don't get much call to practice my trade. His hand fastened on Pogo's. It was kind of alarming how hard the old man squeezed. Tell me, how can I help my son? It's not me, sir. It's, it's the giant. John's eyebrows climbed several centimeters nearer to heaven. Really? That monstrous creature is desirous of joining the fold? Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I think so. But maybe this isn't a good time with you needing to talk to me before you send me uh, on to the moon and like Charlemagne in so much need and everything. Nonsense, John said firmly. Always time to assist an errant soul looking to find its way to the bosom of our almighty father. Well, I, I can't tell that, I can't help noticing that Caligurant talks about being hungry all the time. And I'm beginning to think he means in kind of um, a spiritual way. Do giants have souls? That is in dispute, 
said John, his eyes growing distant. In fact, this might be a fascinating opportunity to determine... He trailed off and made an effort to focus again. I, I, I'm sorry, but we really should discuss your quest first. Then perhaps we can find time to pursue this interesting sideline afterward. Now, uh, perhaps you can tell me about the religious training of your youth. Were you a squire to a pious knight? Oh, oh, definitely. Inwardly, Pogo was cursing. He'd had the Baptist on the hook, you could tell. Come on, Cashman, he told himself. Like the Kirby Shoes manual says, nothing shows if you don't close. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> yeah, we totally have to deal with the important stuff first. And I'm totally going to answer your question, too. It's just that, well, he cries at night when he thinks no one is around. The giant? Asked John the Baptist in tones of astonishment. He laments his state? Cries about all the innocent people he's eaten. Yeah, absolutely. You should talk to him about it. I, I really think like he's all ready to come to Jesus. He wondered if lying like this was a sin, but since this was an only a made-up version of John the Baptist and he was lying to him about a made-up giant too, well, how bad a sin could it be? Clearly, I must speak with this deluded creature, said John, standing and brushing off his crimson, crimson cloak. Not to mention that the prophet Daniel, who has always been very certain of who and who would not be redeemed, would be most instructed if I should convert the creature. His eyes gleamed, and smarty pants Isaiah would be pretty surprised too. Uh, um, just to warn you, he won't admit it or anything. I mean, he's really stubborn. Hogo forced a laugh. Ha! <laughs> You know these giants, you'll have to keep after him. It, it may take a while. John seemed full of energy and high spirits. No fear. After all, we have until the second coming. Pogo almost had to run to keep up with the ancient evangelist, who seemed to be heading right for the stables. So keen was he to begin the ogre's conversion. But uh, what about me getting to the moon? Don't worry. John called back over his shoulder as he broke into a run. I'll have one of the grooms hitch up the chariot for you. Practically drives itself. As the golden chariot was tugged into the sky by the four ruby red horses and the ground fell away with sickening speed causing quid probe to grab the railing and gasp at the unfamiliar and queasy feeling of acceleration on organic skeletal structure, he could still hear the giant bellowing far below. No, shut up and leave Caligarant alone. Suffer, little children, only good part. Quid probe looked down at the retreating ground once, then decided not to do that again. Instead, he tried to focus on the great pale orb of the daytime moon, which was growing larger every moment. Are the horses going to be able to breathe? Pogo Cashman asked, like in space? Quid Probe shook his head, although he was mildly impressed with the question. The Pogo Cashman hadn't shown much interest in such practical things to this point. This is based on medieval imagination, not reality, he said. Point one, those horses are magical flying horses, so they can probably breathe where we're going. And if we're lucky, so can we. Hmm. Pogo Cashman looked down at his armor. Hadn't thought about us. This isn't exactly an astronaut suit, is it? Pretty cool, though. I mean, if I was 12 again, I'd think this was the greatest thing ever. His bemused smile didn't last long. Right now, though, I'm just kind of wanting to go home. Quid Probe sighed. When I was a youngster, I dreamed of being the world's foremost jelly tube architect. I never imagined I'd be flying around in the open air wearing a body with bones in it. Poor little dude, 
the pogo cash man said, patting him on the head in a way that made quid probes dwarf whiskers bristle. Don't sweat it. We'll get out of this okay. You said it's a story, right? Stories always end happy. Quidprobe was glad none of his colleagues from the existential despair division were present. Clearly, the pogo cash man was familiar with only the most elemental kinds of fictional universes. A moment later, though, Quidprobe realized that he desperately wanted the pogo cash man to be right. Ah, by the silver buttocks of Edison and the smoking jacket of Cabell, he thought in sudden horror. What if this is one of those stories where the companion dies? Quid probe spent the rest of the ride sitting in the bottom of the chariot, trying not to hyperventilate. The surface of the moon was even crazier than Pogo had thought it would be, like the abandoned set to some ancient black and white movie with bits of ruined walls and statues poking through shifting dunes of sand and the earth hanging close above their heads in a most disturbing way. The saint who rigged up the chariot had told them to head toward the highest hills and soon they were standing on the peak of the highest looking, down in, look, of the highest, looking down into a bowl-shaped valley, which from this distance appeared to be nothing so much as a badly tended landfill, littered with a zillion odds and ends. They left the chariot on the hill and made their way carefully down the slope. So, this is it? Pogo asked as they neared the lake of bric-a-brac. We're supposed to find... Bro Roland's brain in all this. Everything here is something that someone on earth lost, the dwarf explained. That was Ariosto's idea anyway. The saints said all the lost wits are in one part. Oh, I got it. Just got to find the right section, like men's casuals or children's. Quid probe looked puzzled, but Pogo was on familiar ground now. He scrambled a little way back up the slope and began to scan the valley, looking for clues as to how the merchandise was inventoried. In his store, they kept all the similar things together, so all the men's dra black dress shoes were in one area, all the brown ones beside it, and a little farther away, the men's casual and sport shoes. It shouldn't be too hard to make sense of this if he could only recognize what the various objects were. Start walking around. He called down to Quid Probe. Tell me what some of this stuff is. The little man began an awkward tour through the mounds, calling out what he found to the best of his ability to recognize it. Lost keys, he shouted as he stepped through a field of clinking bronze and iron. Letters, he yelled, then picked one up to read a few lines. The prose is quite romantic. Think this might be lost loves. He trudged along, stopping to shade his eyes against the earth glare. There's a mountain over there that looks like it's made of suitcases and steamer trunks. Goodness, it's quite big. Lost luggage, I bet, spoke Pogo called. Keep going. The dwarf picked his way through artifacts, both real and imaginary. The collars of thousands of lost dogs and cats a lake of corroded clocks representing lost time and an even larger sea filled with silver and gold coins and paper money, perhaps the monetary losses of drunkards and gamblers. For a moment, Pogo considered slaloming down the sandy hill and filling his pockets with some of those coins. The gold itself should at least be worth something. But since Quid Probe kept telling him this was all imaginary stuff, he doubted it would come back with him if he even made it back home, that was. Immense piles of bent swords and broken arrows, which might represent lost battles or lost nerve, delicate masks cracked and dirtied, quid pro guessed they might have something to do with lost reputations, and an immense uneven field of toys and dolls that the little man suggested might stand for lost innocence. The dwarf listed them off and Pogo took note trying to see something like the organizational grid he had learned in his management, training, work, training workbook, knowing your inventory equals sales power. As the timeless day wore on and he could begin to make out some patterns, he scrambled down the slope and joined the little man. 
All of the saddest and most personal things seem to be clustered at one end of the immense sea of lost wages, savings, and livelihoods, where the coins glittered like the foamy caps of frozen waves. So he led quid probe there, and they began to search every mound, puzzling for long moments over what some of the objects might represent. Hey, dick robe, he called. I think I found something. It's quick poop, snarled the little man, kicking something in his irritation. No, no, quid probe, quid probe. See what you've done. I don't even know my own name anymore. Whoa, Mullo, dude, I was just messing with you. He'd actually figured out the dwarf's correct name several days ago, but it was more fun to make up new ones, especially because each time he pretended to get the name wrong, quid probe squeaked like a rubbed balloon. Anyway, I think I might have found what we're looking for. It's a bunch of little jars with people's name on them. He bent and picked one up, read the carefully engraved label. Who's Empedocles? Empedocles, Greek philosopher, called Quid Pro from somewhere on the far side of a heap of lost opportunities. Jumped into a volcano to prove he was a god. Was he? No. Jackpot. Pogo picked up another. Pythagoras. Pythagoras. Another brilliant thinker, except he thought beings had little human souls in them. Okay, this is looking good. Joan of Arc? Heard voices, said Quid Pro. Trusted the English. Crazy as a coot. The dwarf sounded much more cheerful. Hold on, I'll come help. As he and the little man clambered over the mounds of shifting jars, each one filled with a cloudy but slightly luminous liquid, a label caught Pogo's eye. He picked it up and examined the jar, which was larger than most of the others, although still no bigger than a soft drink can. Caligula. He knew the name. It was a dirty movie about some emperor guy who had sex with everything that moved and a few things that didn't. There had been ads all over. One of the men's magazines Pogo kept in a box in his closet. If this was that Caligula's guy's wits, did that mean his memories were inside it too? Pogo lifted the jar up and tried to stare into the shifting fluids, hoping for just the faintest visible scene of a Roman orgy. But no matter how he stared, he couldn't make out anything but the cloudy liquid. Oh! Oh! Quid Pro began to shout, quite close by, startling him. Shamed, he hid the Caligula jar. What? What is it? By the hierarchies of Heinlein, I believe I've found it. Come over here! Pogo made his way across mounds of shifting cut crystal jars to the dwarf's side. The little man was holding a container nearly as large as Caligula's. Pogo squinted at the silver nameplate and shook his head in disappointment. No, man, this belongs to some dude named Orlando. That's the Italian way of saying Roland, the dwarf told him. And look at how big it is. It's his, it must be. By the little guy's excitement, Pogo could tell that Quid Probe was feeling ready to go home, too. Well, uh, cool then, I guess. Let's take it and get going. Good job. Pogo was a little sad he hadn't found it himself. After all, wasn't he supposed to be the hero of this story? Well, it was nice of those guys to let us hang on to the chariot. Pogo said, staring over the side as whatever ocean stretched between Ethiopia and Charlemagne land rolled away beneath them. So where are we headed now? Paris, said Quid Probe. The fairies and Saracens have it under siege and only Roland can save the day. Right. Pogo squinted at a sailing ship far below, so tiny he half expected to see someone waiting after it, trying to recover it and put it back into its bottle. What's a Saracen again? The villain in this particular epic, the dwarf told him. Non-Christians. Pogo thought guiltily of its own meager 40-watt faith. Right, yeah, damn those Saracens. After some time had passed, they swooped down over the fields of ripening grain, gliding so low that Pogo could see workers looking up in astonishment. It was kind of cool, really, riding in a flying chariot. 
He wondered if he would be rewarded for bringing this Roland guy back his brains. Maybe Charlemagne would give him a castle of his own and a bunch of servants. If he got to keep the chariot, it would be even better. All it was missing to be the near-perfect ride was a righteous sound system, so he could sweep down on bad guys, blasting smoke on the water at concert volume. But really, I'd rather go home, he had to admit to himself. Somewhere they already have stuff like James Bond movies and car stereos and onion rings. Somewhere I know how things work. At last they reached Paris, where the twin arms of Islam and Ferry had surrounded the city walls like coffee grounds filling the sink around a failed garbage disposal. As they flew over, many of the enemy troops pointed up at them, shouting curses and firing arrows, but the flying horses nimbly avoided the hostile shafts and then brought the chariot swooping down over the walls to land in a commons at the center of the city where the tents of the besieged army were massed. There were many colorful banners trembling in the breeze like, Pogo couldn't help thinking, the triangular pennants of the world's largest used car lot. When they landed, the dwarf announced who they were, and they were taken by a company of armed men to the king. Seated on his throne, armored all in gold, gray-bearded Charlemagne looked noble enough to make Pogo instantly wish to enroll in whatever management training courses he offered. Now this was what a supervisor should look like. Our thanks, noble Duke Astolfo, the king said in a voice almost exactly like the dad from Bonanza. You have done us a great service by freeing Prester John, and soon may prove to have done an even greater one if you can bring back the wits of our greatest paladin, Sir Roland. Pogo mumbled that the king was welcome. Already the messenger pigeons tell me that Prester John has brought his armies to bear on both Duke Aelfric's ferry and Agramant's infidel lands, Charlemagne continued. Both have already lost much of their stomach for this siege. I think if Roland should be managed to return to health and bring his mighty blade Durendal back to my service, their resolve should quickly crumble. But where is Roland, your highness? asked Quid Probe. Ranging all across Paris like the madman he is, destroying property and the lives of those who try to restrain him. I have asked my bravest knights to harry him hence with trumpet sounding so that we may try this sovereign cure you have brought for us. You have brought for us for his broken wit. He paused. Hark, do you hear? Even now he comes toward us. Pogo could hear the horns quite clearly, dozens of them all blatting and tooting excitedly like a monster rush hour backup on the 405. Charlemagne and his court got up and hurried outside in time to discover one of the strangest things Pogo had ever seen. Several dozen knights in armor getting their butts severely kicked by one naked, frothing, bearded man. It was pretty impressive, actually, like an episode of the Hulk where they'd run out of budget for green makeup. The knights were armed with shields and spears and swords and axes and the naked guy with nothing but a massive log that might have been the roof beam of a large house, but which he was swinging as though it were a little league-sized Louisville, Louisville slugger, bashing armed men out of the saddles and sending them flying through the air to crash in crumpled heaps that Pogo suspected would be impossible to do anything about until someone invented the can opener. Ropes! shouted Charlemagne in his booming Ben Cartwright voice. Throw ropes about him! Now, Pogo really did expect to see Haas and Little Joe run out with their lariats, but instead a variety of soldiers came forward and flung loops, loops of rope over Roland, who seemed more bemused than angry, at least until he tried to move on and found that the ropes prevented it. As he was flinging the soldiers around at the end of their cords like armored yo-yos, more soldiers ran in with more restraints until at last Roland was temporarily brought to a helpless standstill and could do nothing but growl and snap at the air. Now, said Quid Probe, shoving Pogo forward. The crystal jar! Hurry up and make him un inhale it! Go to, Duke Astolfo, cried Charlemagne. The fate of all the Christian world is upon thy brave shoulders. 
Pogo couldn't help noticing that even with more than two dozen men holding him, bearded, crazy Roland was looking like he might break free any moment. Pogo swallowed hard, then dashed forward past the soldiers and between the straining ropes, trying to get close enough to make the mad knight breathe the fumes. Roland fixed him with a rolling eye. I will, I will, I will, I will, he shouted, spittle flying. Kill me. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, I, I totally would if I were you. Pogo reached under his chest plate and pulled out the crystal jar, then cracked it open beneath Roland's nose. Something glowing and silvery rushed out and into the night's distended nostrils. <laughs> Roland roared, then suddenly a very different look crept onto his face, an expression of surprise. Sweet Jove, the great knight shouted, looking down at himself in dismay. I am naked and hairy. What have I done? The look of surprise quickly turned into something more severe an expression of horrific shame. By the vestals, I, I made my horse a senator. What was I thinking? And I married one of my own sisters as well, not even the good-looking one. With this, Roland threw himself in the dirt and began to crawl on his hands and knees, weeping and pulling his hair. Pogo stood watching, trying to figure out what had happened. Was this what the knight was normally like when he was sane? If so, Pogo couldn't understand how he was going to be much use against fairies and Samaritans. While everyone else was staring, quid probes sidled up next to Pogo. Um, are you certain that you gave him the right wits back? I mean, if I didn't know better, I'd swear he sounded less like Roland than like one of the crazier Roman emperors. You know, like Caligula. Pogo said. Damn, I must have pocketed his jar when you called me. He reached under the breastplate and found a second jar waiting there. He took it out and saw to his relief that this one was indeed labeled Orlando. So what do we do now? Pogo asked. King Charlemagne and his court watched in slightly amused and bemused wonderment as Duke Astolfo and a dwarf chased a scuttling, weeping Roland around the town square. When they caught him at last, Quid Probe managed to get a foreshortened leg lock around one of the knight's arms so Pogo could get the vial under his nose and pull the stopper. As Roland inhaled between wails of lamentation, the silvery stuff flew up his nose. The naked man paused as if tasting something beloved and familiar, then relaxed, smiling with relief. Yes, he cried. Praise God, I am released from my madness. I am Roland again. This time, the naked man leaped to his feet with a loud cry of joy and relief, incidentally throwing Astolfo and the dwarf quite a distance, so that as the noise of celebration rose at the bold knight's return, Pogo and, and Quid Probe just lay on their backs and waited for the sky to stop spinning. Dude, Pogo said at last, that was pretty weird. Does this mean we can go home now? I think it's time to find out, said the dwarf. Let's get out of here before these armies start killing each other all over again. Once he's done celebrating, Roland's going to be tossing Saracen heads all over the place. Pogo nodded and helped the dwarf to his feet. As they walked quickly away from the crowd that surrounded the noble, if still nude, Roland Pogo examined the damage the long siege had done, the burned and ruined houses, the countless fresh graves, and the bloated corpses of animals lying unburied in the street. Whoa. Everyone says Paris is so great, but it's kind of a dump, really. I mean, seriously, how do they ever get tourists to come here? Nearing the end, folks, don't worry. Quid Probe was astonished to be both alive and in one piece, and was in a hurry to get back to the symbolic plane before the metaverse realized how unlikely that was and decided to rejigger the odds. Intervention over, he told the Pogo cash man. The story has been fulfilled. As soon as I get back to the department, I'll send you home again. Promise, man? 
I mean, this is pretty interesting to visit, but I wouldn't want to live here, if you know what I mean. Quid probe only nodded. For once, he knew exactly what the pogo cash man meant. I promise. I can't send you home until I get back to the department where all the machinery is, but as soon as I get there, I'll do it. He took a breath, noting for perhaps the last time how strange it felt when the lungs inside his chest inflated. How awkward organic life was, but interesting too. As Quid Probe began to consider the price, precise symbolic consequence, sorry, as Quid Probe began to consider the price, <laughs> as Quid Probe began to consider the precise symbolic sequence of thoughts that would take him back, an idle curiosity floated up to him. What other sensations did organic beings have? that he had never experienced on the symbolic plane. Ah, ah, he told himself, no use wondering because I'm never going to do something like this again, ever. The pogo cash man was looking at him strangely as he finished his preparations. What is it? Quid Probe asked. H have we forgotten something? No, no, I'm just... The organic creature was avoiding eye contract, contact. It seems strange. I'm, I'm kind of going to miss you, little dude. Which was odd because Quid Probe himself had been feeling something similar, although he had not realized it until just now. Where I come from, he told the Pogo Cash Man, extending a bony organic hand, we say, may all your stories have a proper ending. And... As my people say, said the pogo cash man, slapping the palm of Quid, Quid Probe's hand even as they both began to turn intangible to each other. Give me five and keep on trucking, baby. A moment later, Quid Probe was tumbling down a long, whistling tunnel of different shades, temperatures, and textures of blackness. After a while, it began to resolve itself into shapes a whole crowd of shapes, all his co-workers and managers, and even Fanut, the supervisor. And they were all clearly waiting for him. Welcome banners, treats, and streamers. It was a party for him. Quid Probe was thrilled. Someone had seen what he was doing and alerted his supervisors. He had been noticed and now his bravery would be celebrated and he might well even be rewarded for saving the matter of France and all of Western literature. But although his co-workers waved and cheered as he coalesced back into the collection of symbolic solids he had worn all his life until this adventure, he saw that many of them were also laughing, although they were doing their best not to make it obvious. Then, as his familiar world came into sharper focus, he could finally read the signs. Welcome back, quick poop. Quit pump. Our hero. Congratulations, quart punk. He stood for a moment, glowering at them. Very funny, he said. Did anyone notice I saved the world? Fanat, the supervisor, stepped forward and handed him a piece of treat sweet on a disposable plate. In all seriousness, you did very well, quick, uh, quid probe. Saved the department a lot of trouble. Good to have you back. Quid probe thanked him. The departmental supervisor wandered off to refill his container of natured spirits. And for a moment, quid probe just stood and soaked in the glory of his successful return. The proximity of his own office and peers and home. He stretched out one of his pseudopods and reveled in its boneless suppleness, its entirely obvious rightness. Yes, it is very good. It was very good to be home indeed at last. Which suddenly reminded him of his former companion, still stuck in an imaginary past for which, recent victories aside, he was probably not entirely suited. Quid Probe hurried to the office machinery center, his fingers slippery with frosting and his rubbery young soul in a hurry to get back to the party. A party in honor of him. He punched the button. 
safe journey, my friend, he said to the image. Someone had put on some music, something slithery and non-traditional. The younger workers were dancing. Quid pro didn't stay to watch the monitor. Pogo was just beginning to worry that the dwarf might have forgotten him when the walls of Paris began to grow faint and translucent before his eyes, as though the entire damaged city was turning into glass. A moment later, he found himself hurtling down what seemed like the world's longest, driest, and coldest slip and slide. Finally going home, was his thought as the winds between realities spun him. Finally! But he'd had a pretty amazing adventure. And he'd done pretty damn well if he said so himself. He really deserved some kind of reward. And to think it all happened because he got sent into the story instead of some English soldier spy guy. Yeah, the English guy. Wonder whatever happened to him. A moment later, Pogo tumbled out of the void and into the reality of his familiar world, to warmth and carpets and beautifully painted oriental screens and heavy wood furniture. And also to a slender, naked woman sitting on a bed brushing her hair with her back to Pogo. Hurry, darling, she said in one of those posh upstairs, downstairs PBS accents. It's cold. I want to get under the covers with you so you can warm me up. In fact, I want you to do more than just warm me up, you amazing man. Reward, Pogo thought. Jackpot! Hallelujah! But then she turned and saw him standing in the doorway. For a moment, a look of confusion seized her lovely face. You, you're not my husband. Who are you? Then she began to scream and scream and scream. Pogo was going to find it very difficult to explain to the village constable what he was doing in Mr. Castlemaine's house. Meanwhile, 6,000 miles away, the appearance of a naked Englishman in the middle of Kirby Shoe's summer madness was barely noticed. There was a sale going on, after all. And that is the end of the story. So, that ran a tiny bit longer than I expected. So, but, uh, <laughs> I hope that you all enjoyed it. Um, anyway, uh, I see many, many remarks here. I'm not going to have a chance to read tonight because I have to go find some food. Um, but I hope you all enjoyed the end of the story. Uh, fat for last, for now, is the last of Pogo. Um, someday I may write another Pogo story if I can find an excuse, but that's the last of him for now. Glad those of you who seem to have enjoyed it, enjoyed it. I certainly enjoy reading it to you. Um, I really should start reading some of these stories ahead of time and figuring out what accents I'm going to do. It would make it easier. But then again, we would lose some of the spontaneity of my stupid unwillingness to prepare. So <laughs> if you value that at all, there you go. you got to take the, uh, the smooth, the rough with the smooth, I guess. So from, from Quid Probe and uh, Pogo, and Roland, and Charlemagne, and everybody else, I thank you very much. Please do take good care of yourselves, take good care of your loved ones, take good care of your neighbors, and your co-workers, and your friends. We will get through this, we will get out the other side, we can go back into the world and do stupid things all over again without having to pay some horrible price for it, uh, as long as they're not too stupid. There are still certain things like carrying around what you assume is a dud grenade in your mouth, saying, look at me, I'm a St. Bernard, for instance. Um, don't do that. Anyway, oh, and there's my niece. Hello, Joanna. How are you, darling? And, uh, and all tons of other people, Sherry and Mike and and, and Medardo again and, and, and all kinds of lovely folk. It's really lovely to see you all coming to join me, so thank you. And with that, I will say good night and wish you all a happy 5th of July, um, unless you're on the other side of the dateline, in which case, I don't know where the hell you are. Never, never land. And I will say also, 
farewell. Come back. Join me soon. I will be here next week. Same two tad times, same two tad channels. <laughs>